correct answer to my question undoubtedly would have been wow yes of course mason rudolph's gonna be our quarterback next week in seattle but that's not the answer that i got so we're gonna take this one day at a time good morning to you Good Sunday morning. I'm Dayon Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is a special edition of Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way usually bright and early every weekday. If you're into hockey and or baseball, I also offer every weekday daily shots of Penguins and Pirates in the same place that you find this show. Steelers 34, Bengals 11. If I hadn't been there, I wouldn't have believed it. But having been there, I do believe it. I do believe that what I witnessed was real, certainly from the standpoint of the quarterback position. Rudolph's numbers, 17 of 27 for 290 yards, two touchdowns, both of them massive plays to George Pickens, no interceptions, one sack, a 124.0 rating. All of this, my friends, is alien territory to the 2023 Steelers. And really, if you want to go back to last year, to the 2022 Steelers as well. Really, to the post-Ben Roethlisberger Steelers. That's what we're talking about. In fact, Rudolph became, with his performance, the first Pittsburgh quarterback to produce 250-plus yards and two touchdown passes in the same game Since Ben himself did it back in 2021, that's how poor the performances have been at this sport's most important position for far too long. So one might think, that's a might, that the head coach would just come right out and state the obvious. He generally doesn't do that sort of thing in post-game press conferences, but I gave it a shot anyway. I guess this is early to ask, but would you be sticking with Mason in Seattle? You're right. It is early I to ask. So. Yep. And that was that. Now, there's zero controversy in this, okay? I mean, less than zero. There is no way Tomlin is going to emerge for his Tuesday press conference after having watched this film And after having thought about it, assuming he's even thinking about it, and say anything other than that Rudolph's going to be his starter next Sunday against the Seahawks. But you want to know something? That's not even the part that I find most interesting here. And yeah, we're going to have you and I a lot of chances to discuss what happened this season for the Steelers to ignore Rudolph, really what would have happened last season for the Steelers to ignore Rudolph, or maybe even going further back. And there's the obvious herd of elephants in the room with Ben still being around. But once Ben was gone, you know, did it really have to be that difficult? The other question, of course, that comes within that is, was what Rudolph showed last night legit? My feeling is that it was mostly through the process of a long checklist that I've had for him for several years. Remember when we didn't like his happy feet? Remember that was the number one problem that he had? You see that last night? Nope. Stood in there time and time again. Didn't budge. Now, the offensive line was better, including at picking up blitzes. The running backs were both good in this regard, but... They still got there, the Bengals did, and Rudolph just didn't care. They were flying right into his face, and he'd stand there, find his intended target, and fire it in that direction, or just place it softly, which leads me to another thing on the checklist. Remember I brought this up on the show several times, actually, over the past week, how Rudolph's always been adept. At the bombs. That goes back to Oklahoma State, James Washington, and creaming pit once at Heinz Field. It was just bomb after bomb after bomb. And he's always been able to do that. He's always had that big arm and he's always had that touch for the deep passes, but he has not had it on the shorter passes. And that's what would kill him. He'd be looking at a guy that was 
10 yards away from him and just sail it way over his head or just throw it right into the ground. And you're like, dude, this is supposed to be the easy part. Well, he did the easy part in this game. The pass to Pickens for the first touchdown for the 86 yarder that covered just 14 yards in the air. That's it. But he put it exactly where it needed to be, exactly when it needed to be there. Over a linebacker in front of two other Cincinnati defenders, both of whom just happened to be safeties. So once George saw some grass, he kept going. How about the toughness? How about that run near the goal line that had the place flipping out? How about not sliding, not going into that quarterback slide the way Mitch Trubisky did a couple of weeks ago when your team really, really, really needs the W? All of these are checks. Check, check, and check. How about spreading the ball around to all those different targets? You want to know who all caught a pass in this game? Jalen Warren, Allen Robinson, Deontay Johnson, Darnell Washington, Miles Boykin, If that sounds like the tight ends are conspicuously absent, that was addressed afterward, too, because the Bengals weren't going to let Pat Fryermuth beat them again the way he did a month ago with those nine catches in Cincinnati. So, you hit their weak spots. You go where they aren't. That involves reading the field. Now, you might want to dismiss this, maybe even just to manage your own level of hope or whatever, and say, well, he, you know, it's his first start in three years. He had the family there, mom and dad. It might have been his last chance to have a start in the NFL, as he'd openly acknowledge afterward. So the whole thing's just a once-in-a-lifetime, I don't know, Christmas miracle or something. But here's what really became exposed to everyone. Rudolph, since the last time the public saw him, aside from preseason games, got better. We've seen signs of this the past couple of preseasons, this most recent one especially. But preseason is rightfully downplayed, even dismissed by most. A lot of his teammates in the locker room pointed more than anything else to the fact, and it is a fact, that he never stopped working, never stopped preparing, as T.J. Watt would word it, to be the starting quarterback on any given weekend. This is how Mason himself put it when asked just about going through his progressions each week. Yeah, I think as much as it's um, as hard as it is to sit and watch for, you know, two and a half years, um, I think... you can you can sort of just go on autopilot mode, or you can try to improve and put yourself and say the call, call the play in the huddle, like the snap count. You know, try to go through, simulate what you would do if you were in there. And, and um, I, th- I think just when years go by, your football IQ improves, and I credit that you know to our staff and to Mike T. We, we've got great meetings each week in the morning where he kind of gives a synopsis from a defensive perspective and. Um, so yeah, I think I just felt good having the whole week of reps, man. You know, the last time I played, I was found out, you know, 12 hours and 24 hours before. So it's nice to build the confidence through the week. Hey, you know what? He's 28 years old and he's actually in a way a little young for that age, considering he's obviously got limited wear and tear. Why would anybody write him off? Just because the Steelers or their management made a mistake doesn't mean that everyone else has to as well. When we come back, J1Q. This segment of Daily Shot is brought to you by our good friends at Mike's Beer Bar. They're located on Federal Street, directly across from PNC Park. Mike has more than 500 beers on tap, including from more than 50 local breweries. Stop in and say hello. Tell Mike we sent you. Mike's Beer Bar. Today's J1Q comes from Jake, and it's obviously going to be on the subject of the day. 
He says, DK, hindsight's always 2020, but wouldn't it have been great if Mason Rudolph had shown more of what he did in this game in his tryout during Ben Roethlisberger's injury season? Then we'd never have wasted precious resources on Mitch Trubisky and Kenny Pickett. Mason would be a seasoned vet by now, and we could have a better offensive line with what was used to acquire KP and Mitch. Anyway, still nice to sweep the Bengals this season and spoil their chances. Jake, your retroactive wishing here is going to fall on two deaf ears at this end. Uh, With all due respect, not everybody advances into the NFL or through the NFL at the same pace. And this is probably doubly true of the quarterback position. Remember that it was Ben who would often say that it would take three years to fully judge a quarterback. Now, when Ben was asked that for full context, as I was there when it happened, he was being asked about a, a class of young QBs, including Robert Griffin the third that had everyone all stoked and Ben was like, hey, hey, take it easy here. Let's see how it goes over time. The way his class, his draft class, would be weighed over time. Well, Mason never had that. This was his 11th start in the NFL. 11th start. This was his first start in 769 days. This was his first start since November 14 of 2021, a game that was a 16 to 16 tie here in Pittsburgh against the Lions, in which a whole bunch of bungled plays by his receivers ended up costing the Steelers the win instead of just getting the tie. If he'd gotten the win, does he get more chances? I don't know. I don't know. If you want to go back to the previous season, he played the final game of the regular season, which for standings purposes and playoff purposes was meaningless. So the Steelers rested everybody and the Browns rested everybody. This was up in Cleveland. And Rudolph was quite good in that game. Didn't win it, but was more than good enough to have won it. Now, rewinding before that, that's when all eight of the other starts occurred the year that you're referring to, Jake, 2019. Rudolph was thrown in in week two when Ben got hurt early. This was a home game. And then in his first start was the following week out in Santa Clara, California against the 49ers, in which he almost beat a team that ended up going to the Super Bowl, in large part because of their defense. Then he gets concussed. Then he gets a helmet swung at his head. Then he gets embroiled in this whole idiotic discussion that was generated by Miles Garrett lying about something that he said five days after the fact, conveniently, that Rudolph had spoken on the field and never happened, according to everyone else who was on that field. But between Rudolph being a second-year guy and having all of this thrown at him without a training camp of preparation or anything. And then on top of that, it just, it was like he was uh, walking in a, a Mr. Magoo cartoon with anvils falling on his head every which way he turned. I'm not going to look at those eight starts and come close to trying to define somebody's career the same way that as I'm speaking to you right now, I'm not ready to bury Kenny Pickett either. Because Kenny's had his own outside contextual things to deal with. I love to cite baseball examples, like in sports and in life. One of my favorite phrases to use in covering baseball is last bad thing I saw syndrome. And yes, I completely made that up, but I've been using it for years. If you're a fan, let's say, of the Pirates and they have a relief pitcher who in the second week of April gives up a couple of very untimely home runs and costs the Pirates a couple of games, you will hate that relief pitcher for the rest of his life. (laughs) That poor guy can never take the mound again with you thinking that this is a competent professional pitcher. Why? Last bad thing I saw. 
He could go out there for the next 30 to 50 games, even be considered for an all-star nomination, fireman of the year. You won't care. Last bad thing I saw. Well, in Mason's case, you're going all the way back. You just did it yourself to five years ago or four years ago to one game that was meaningless or three years ago to a tie with the Lions in which he actually played really well. And that's it. That's all anyone has. So why wouldn't anyone look at that game last night and just see it for what it is, which is a game that's been played after several years, as you just heard from Mason's mouth, of his learning more, working harder, and becoming better. Now look, before anybody states the obvious, I haven't exactly been the leader of the pro-Mason as starter movement. Because, to be open and honest with you here, I believed a lot of what I heard on the inside, which is that he has not generally practiced well. And that's always concerned the coaching staff. Well, some people, as Allen Iverson, I believe, famously put it once, are a whole lot better in games than they are in practices. This was a game. This was a big game, and this was a big performance that can't, and I believe won't, be ignored. Not in Seattle, not in Baltimore, and maybe not beyond. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. I want to take this opportunity to wish everyone on this Christmas Eve the merriest and happiest and healthiest of holidays tomorrow and this program will be back on Tuesday morning 